John Gebser, born in August 1905, was very much a thinker of a different age in more ways than one. While many modern intellectuals tend to be herded into ever more finely carved out specializations, having much to say about extremely narrow bands of human inquiry and very little to say about what goes on beyond the confines of their particular academic boxes, Gebser was instead an exemplar of a kind of thinker which is now almost extinct. One concern most of all with the broadest scope of our understanding regarding the nature of human existence and the narratives of the immense historical processes which our lives are embedded in. Although there are certainly thinkers today whose thought extends to such grand scales, the scope and breadth of Gebser's work is exemplary of an intellectual world which was drastically different in temperament from our own. A temperament which regarded the project of human understanding as one which transcended the bounds of particular academic disciplines, and one which oriented itself towards encompassing unification as much as towards specialization. Within his most well-known work, The Ever-Present Origin, Gebser attempts to distill the story of human existence, not in terms of biological or neurophysiological evolution, nor in terms of socio-political evolution, but rather in terms of the evolution of consciousness itself. In doing so, Gebser looks across the vast breadth of the human narrative, as it extends from the murky depths of our prehistoric past, all the way to the bizarre and rapidly evolving world of modernity, and to what may lay beyond the horizons of what we are currently able to imagine. Gebser looks to the histories of art, poetry, and religious thought, as well as to the histories of science and philosophy in his endeavor, as he attempts to illustrate what he sees as the stages by which human consciousness has come to unfold throughout the course of prehistory, history, and how this unfolding will continue into the future. Consciousness, of course, is a term which is used in various ways, and therefore one with meanings which can often be both various and nebulous. Rather than attempting to define consciousness in a precise or analytic manner, something which Gebser himself does not attempt to do, I will instead say a few things about how we might think about consciousness in order to lay a broad and provisional foundation for our path forward. Consciousness, whatever we may make of it in terms of metaphysics or psychology, can be understood as a mode of being present within a world, which consists of things other than itself. Heidegger's examination of Dasein illustrates this conception of consciousness in terms of phenomenology and ontology and shows us that consciousness is always a matter of being situated within a world and within time. Moreover, Heidegger shows us that world and consciousness are not only codependent, but also co-conditioning. The phenomenological texture and tone of the world varies in relation to the character of the consciousness which is present within the world, and which thus allows the world to become present through consciousness and with consciousness. Consciousness is not an abstract mechanism of thought or sensory processing which exists independently of an inert and passively objective world. As Kant and his successors, such as Schelling and Heidegger, have shown us, the world which we encounter is a world 
which is within consciousness, just as consciousness is within the world. Aside from whatever world might be thought to exist beyond such relations, in reality the world which we actually encounter in reality is one which is by necessity a world in relation to consciousness. We can therefore see that consciousness is fundamentally relational. The world becomes present through consciousness, and consciousness itself cannot be understood apart from its presence within a world. Consciousness also brings things within the world into relation with one another, as the world's constituents come to co-participate within the horizons of consciousness. This bringing into relation is absolutely essential in our efforts to understand Gebser's narrative of evolving structures of consciousness. As we shall see, distinctive structures of consciousness differ in the manner by which they are able to facilitate such relation. It is through the development of new dimensionalities that consciousness truly comes to unfold its potentials. As consciousness comes to reveal novel ways of bringing things within the world into relation with one another, the world itself thereby comes to presence in novel ways. Within the pages of the ever-present origin, Gebser outlines and examines in detail the nature and history of five fundamental structures of consciousness. The archaic structure, the magical structure, the mythic structure, the mental structure, and finally the as yet still unfolding integral structure of consciousness. We can perhaps understand this succession of consciousness structures as an expanding series of concentric circles. As a new structure emerges, the previously central structure is pushed outward, moving further out to the periphery of human awareness. As the archaic gives way to the magical, and then the magical gives way to the mythical, the earlier forms of consciousness come to occupy what Jungian or Freudian psychologists would refer to as the subconscious or unconscious realms, while the most recent structure comes to occupy the center stage, thereby conditioning the focal point of our conscious lucidity. We will begin our examination by looking to the most fundamental and primordial structure of consciousness within Gebser's taxonomy, to what he calls the archaic consciousness structure. Quote, the archaic structure is zero-dimensional. It is akin, if not identical, to the original state of biblical paradise, a time where the soul is yet dormant a time of complete non-differentiation of man and the universe. In describing the archaic structure, Gebser attempts to show us a form of consciousness which is entirely devoid of dimensionality, and thus unable to bring about relations of difference. Archaic man is said to exist in a state of absolute indistinction from the world he inhabits. Indeed, even to say that archaic consciousness inhabits a world may be quite misleading. Lacking dimensionality, archaic consciousness is said to be capable only of identification. Identity of human beings with the world, identity of imminent earth and transcendental sky, identity of inner and outer, identity of microcosm and macrocosm. Gebser is quick to clarify that archaic humanity should not be misidentified with tribalistic or shamanic culture which persists still within the modern world. 
as such cultures rather proceed within the realm of the second, magical structure of consciousness, to which we shall next turn our attention. Rather, Gebser tells us that the archaic structure should be understood as something much more primordial, a form of consciousness which is co-primordial with the origination of humanity itself, and perhaps even consciousness itself. Gebser tells us that writings which allude to the archaic structure are exceedingly rare, though as one of precious few examples, he points to a cryptic statement by the foundational Taoist philosopher Shuang Tzu. Quote, Dreamlessly, the true men of earlier times slept. Gebser takes this invocation of dreamlessness to be indicative of a time in which the soul of humanity remains dormant. As Shuang Tzu states elsewhere, dreams are an intercourse of the soul with the world. As the archaic structure lacks distinction between itself and the world, no such intercourse can occur, and the soul itself remains but a potential. As the soul is a self-identity, the possibility of which is conditioned by delineation of self and world. I will briefly add here an aside, that we should be careful not to overly materialize Gebser and Shuang Tzu's statements regarding the dreamless nature of archaic consciousness. In terms of natural science, there is substantial evidence to indicate that all animals, and certainly all mammals, do in fact dream, and thus it undoubtedly is the case that our earliest hominid ancestors did indeed dream. Nonetheless, we should regard such a statement in terms of its broader connotations and implications regarding the development of human consciousness as it can be seen as a gesturing via the use of language heavily inundated with signification regarding consciousness itself. Dream is a notion which has always evoked our awareness of the most dimly lit recesses of the human psyche, and dreamlessness therefore gestures towards depths of our being which are still further removed from the luminosity of waking consciousness. The second fragment which Gebser takes to allude to the archaic structure is one attributed to Plato. Quoted in Aristotle's Metaphysics, it tells us that, quote, the soul came into being simultaneously with the sky. Here again, we must understand that this is not a statement pertaining to the physical sky as we understand it from our modern, deficient, rational, and materialistic standpoint. Rather, we must understand that the sky here refers to an archetypal modality which is of metaphysical and mythical significance yet in such a manner that it alludes to a state of human consciousness which preceded even mythical and metaphysical thinking. The duality of Mother Ocean and Father Sky is one which situates human beings within a convergence of two fundamental modalities of being as beings which reside between the ordered eternality of the heavens and the chaotic tumultuousness of the seething and writhing oceanic depths, human consciousness thus finds itself between order and chaos, between transcendence and imminence, between internal abyss and external expanse, between form and formlessness. Yet this cryptic statement attributed to Plato, that the soul and sky are co-originative, 
gestures to a state of primal oneness, which preceded such dualities, and indeed preceded the distinction of identity between human beings and the world. The heavenly clockwork of the sky represents not only form and order, but also the manner in which such form and order are able to delineate and differentiate. The soul and sky are of a common modality in that the soul is a form of identity, which unifies self-identity and separates self-identity from otherness. In order for there to be a sense of self-world distinction within human consciousness, there must also be a separation of transcendent form and imminent becoming, such that form can be seen as that which maintains and delineates the unification of beings. Microcosm and macrocosm thereby rupture apart from one another. Earth and sky become divided, and soul is born as a sustained and perpetuated difference from world. We might take the remarkable scarcity of references to the archaic structure as itself indicative of the archaic structure's nature. Language itself is often understood to be of fundamentally central significance to human consciousness, and here I would suggest that it is perhaps language itself which may have conditioned the possibility of unfolding dimensionality within the evolution of consciousness. Language itself is an immensely rich subject of philosophical, psychological, and anthropological dialogues, and its centrality to human existence is quite undeniable. Here I would like to suggest that language may indeed be a matter of immense metaphysical significance. Language is a process of signification and communication, and thus it is a means by which consciousness is able to begin bringing forth relations not only of identity, but also of distinction and unity. Signifiers, whether uttered, written, carved, or silently and internally recited, gesture towards the world, or towards oneself, or to other signifiers. The primordial oneness of the archaic structure comes to be mutated by the emergence of a this and that here and there, I and thou, and thereby such speechless, misty, originary oneness gives way to an awareness of particular beings, gives way to dreams, and thus gives way to the magical structure of consciousness. What then, if anything, can be said of such archaic, pre-dimensional consciousness. Even imagining such a state may seem to be beyond the capabilities of our own modern psyches. Yet the archaic structure still lives within us, stirring silently within the most abyssal depths of our being. Therefore, it is perhaps within silence and stillness that we may yet find the archaic structure. Numerous mystical traditions, particularly but not exclusively those of Hindu or Buddhist lineages, emphasize the importance of such meditative stillnesses within the spiritual paths which they advocate. It is said that within the achievement of such pure awareness, one finds the anxieties of self-world delineation give way to the absolute serenity of unbounded oneness. Can we then imagine a state of consciousness in which such oneness is not the result of disciplined meditative concentration, but rather the central structure of human consciousness in general, a state in which human beings carried out their life activities of seeking, feeding, fighting, sleeping, waking, all with awareness, yet without conscious thought as we today typically understand that. 
We might characterize such consciousness as a perpetual state of flow, or even as the Taoist Wu Wei, in which awareness follows perfectly the course of life processes, without any sense of exertion or feelings of contrast between actuality and potentiality. Within contemporary psychological research, flow states tend to be characterized as altered states in which a person becomes fully immersed or absorbed within a given activity. The Hungarian-American psychologist Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi has researched and published extensively regarding the nature of such states, and has described states of flow as states of consciousness within which one finds a cessation of self-referential thought, and indeed a state in which the self often is felt to recede or dissolve into the synthesis of activity and environment. Similarly, we may make analogy with states of ego death, or with what the Zhek psychologist Stanislav Grof refers to as holotropic states of awareness. Within such states of consciousness, induced via meditative practices, consciousness-altering substances, or even near-death experiences, one's sense of self may come to be drastically ruptured, such that the perceived boundaries between self and world come to blur or even melt away entirely. Such experiences demonstrate that the human sense of self is far more malleable, and perhaps far less fundamental, than we might often realize, given how thoroughly rigidified and constant the sense of self tends to be within ordinary or hylotropic consciousness. Despite the stubborn persistence of the self within our own consciousness, it is nevertheless the case that self-world delineation is not in fact fundamental to consciousness itself, and thus we may view the notion of the archaic structure as referring to a phase within the evolution of consciousness which preceded the development of such clear distinction. Ultimately, however, flow states, holotropic states, or any other altered states of modern consciousness must be understood as, at best, imperfect approximations of what archaic consciousness may have been prior to the emergence of higher dimensional structures of consciousness. The archaic structure should not be understood as a permutation of modern consciousness, with its multiplicity of interwoven and layered structures, but rather as consciousness in its most originary and thus ever-present expression, that which lies not beyond, but rather beneath or within the various psychical strata which have been built upon such a primordial foundation. Our capacity to re-invoke the archaic structure must begin where our capacity to describe with language ends. As Gebser concluded his initial discussion of the archaic structure, quote, anyone capable of sensing and presentiating the significance of these utterances of Shuang Tzu and Plato will be able to perceive some measure of the splendor of origin. The first radiance, still present within us, of the emergent world and man that suffuses these words of ancient times. Yet in doing so, we fall silent." End quote. As we consider the archaic structure, we should notice that the central motif of Gebser's narrative is very much a familiar one. The emergence of differentiated multiplicity from homogenous, totalizing identity is a narrative form which is found throughout various cosmogonies of mystical, religious, and philosophical traditions, 
as well as those of modern, physicalist cosmologies. One example of this can be found in the cosmology of Chinese Taoism, in which the undifferentiated state of absolute ultimacy, or Wu Ji, becomes Tai Ji, the unified polarity of yin and yang, which underlies all differentiation, all distinction, and thus all the becomings which comprise the pluralistic and multifaceted world which we inhabit. This Taoist cosmogony expresses the notion of polarity and union of polarity. These modalities of thought which are native to the third, mythical structure of consciousness. Yet we nevertheless see within the conceptions of Wu Ji an echo of archaic, non-polar consciousness. That is, we find an ultimacy which underlies and ontologically precedes all polarity. Another instance of this mythine can be found in Carl Jung's Liber Novus, or Red Book. Within this posthumously published work of mysticism, dreamscapes, and active imagination, the character Philemon is a figure who appears as both a Senex figure as well as a kind of psychopop who guides Jung and the reader through the realms of the personal and collective unconscious. Philemon tells us of the pleroma, a concept which is found within Gnostic thought as well as within the Synoptic Gospels. Quote, now here, I begin with nothingness. Nothingness is the same as the fullness. In infinity, full is as good as empty. Nothingness is empty and full. That which is endless and eternal has no qualities, insect has all qualities. We call this nothingness or fullness the pleroma. Therein both thinking and being cease, since the eternal and endless possess no qualities. Again we see here a reiteration of the same underlying motif. The pleroma precedes and transcends all duality and polarity. It is that which is before all thought and quality, a no-thing that encompasses all things. The face of the deep, which reflects itself and thereby differentiates within itself, thus coming to take on the form of earth and sky. Undifferentiated oneness is ruptured, thereby giving rise to the possibility of difference, of dimensionality, of a soul which is distinct from the world. We could interpret this parallel as indicating that these cosmogonic narratives reflect the emergence of dimensional human consciousness rather than the emergence of the world as we know it from a primal state. That is, that these cosmogonies express a projection of our collective memory onto the cosmos as a whole. However, I would suggest a broader interpretation that the emergence of magical consciousness from archaic consciousness within human beings itself is a reenactment of a motif which is indeed cosmic in scale. As above, so below, we are told by the 19th century theosophist Helena Blavatsky. And this adage may not simply apply to a single duality of transcendent and immanent macrocosm and microcosm, but also to the full range of nested strata which comprise our reality, as such distinct scales are seen to express isomorphisms of self-similarity and recursion. The same mytheme of oneness and differentiation can be seen yet again within the realm of child development psychology. 
Here again we will return to the Zhek psychologist Stanislav Grof, specifically to what he referred to as the basic perinatal matrices, or BPMs. Grof theorized that the basic perinatal matrices are unconscious structures which form within the developing psyches of all infants during the birthing process itself, and which continue to reside within the unconscious of individuals throughout the course of their lives. Within his text, The Cosmic Game, Groff details experiments in which he believed that his subjects, having entered into certain altered or holotropic states of consciousness, were able to psychologically revisit these basic perinatal matrices during experiences characterized by vivid imagery and often strikingly intense emotional states. Here we will look at the first such perinatal matrix, referred to as BPM-1. The first perinatal matrix pertains to the state of an infant prior to birth itself in which the individual resides in a state of oneness with the womb itself, experiencing a state of pure non-differentiation, perhaps akin to a liminal realm between deep sleep and dreams. The experience of subjects believed to have re-invoked BPM-1 are described by Groff as follows. Quote, while experiencing the episodes of undisturbed embryonal existence, we often encounter images of vast regions with no boundaries or limits. Sometimes we identify with galaxies, interstellar space, or the entire cosmos. Other times we have the experience of floating in the ocean or of becoming various aquatic animals, such as fish, dolphins, or whales. This undisturbed intrauterine experience can also open into visions of nature, safe, beautiful, and unconditionally nourishing, like a good womb, Mother Nature. We can see luscious orchards, fields of ripe corn, agricultural terraces in the Andes or unspoiled Polynesian islands. The experience of the good womb can also provide selective access to the archetypal domain of the collective unconscious and open into images of paradise or heavens as they are described in the mythologies of different cultures." End quote. Groff's words are certainly reminiscent of Gebser's description of the archaic structure as being akin or identical to the state of paradisical Eden, as well as, perhaps, Hesiod's description of the harmonious golden age from which mankind's history had descended. Groff himself is quite clear that this primeval state of boundless, Limitless oneness is far from simply a psychological theme pertaining only to the contingent facts of human biology and psychology, but rather a cosmic archetype which human consciousness is able to access through our experiences within which this archetype come to ingress. Quote, Cosmic consciousness is a boundless, undifferentiated field with immense creative potential. Within it, creation begins as a ripple, as a disturbance of the original unity that manifests as playful imagining and imaging of various forms. At first, the created entities maintain their contact with the source and the separation is only tentative, relative, and incomplete. Using the water metaphor, the original, undivided unity of absolute consciousness would have the form of a deep and calm ocean of unimaginable magnitude. The image that can best illustrate the initial stage of the process of creation is the formation of waves on the surface of the ocean." End quote.
We can see this pattern reiterated within the domains of individual human development, within that of cosmological metaphysics, and also within the evolution of human consciousness throughout natural history, as the metamorphosis through which the oceanic oneness of the archaic structure gives way to the differentiation and dimensionality of the magical structure, and thus to the birth of the human soul. Yet as we shall see, the birth of the soul is far from the soul's completion, as the evolution of human identity in relation to the world as well as in relation to itself is a storied journey, one which even now remains in motion.